Pablo, welcome to the Astro Ben podcast. How are you? I'm good. Thanks for having me, Ben. Yeah, I really appreciate you coming on. Um, let's start with some real basics because uh, I'm the first to admit when it comes to the whole uh, crypto Web3 world, I definitely feel like I'm not au okay fait with a lot of the terminology. So your company, Moon Dow, what is a DAO? And is, is that even a valid question? No, it's it's a great question. I get it all the time. And um, I think that, you know, we, we've got this like nerd speak going on where it's like all a different universe, different language. And um, honestly, what, what I'm trying to do now is to try to just like break it down and, and make it understandable for just your, your average person so that my, my mom can understand what's what I'm doing <laughs> with my life, you know. Um, but uh, a DAO, uh, it, it's basically a set of contracts. So, you know, usually um, or traditionally uh, when you or I get into a contract, we sign a piece of paper and then it's enforced by uh, a government. Um, but uh, this is a, a new means of coordination where uh, two people can enter or groups of people can enter into contracts with one another. And then the, uh, the, the result of that contract is enforced through code. So, um, you know, if, if a certain uh, event is triggered, basically all of the rules of that contract live uh, online and are enforced through code. Yeah. Is that like Bitcoin? Because that's, that's, that's sort of what I thought Bitcoin was. It's sort of a digital contract saying, I give you this at this value at this time. And that's a digital contract. Is that right? Yeah, so uh, Bitcoin is kind of like a, a subset of like all, all possible contracts that could be created. So in, in Bitcoin's case, it is uh, an accounting method. So it's a contract that basically says, um, you know, I give you money and then everyone like that, that everyone uh, on that blockchain, that state gets propagated to everyone. Um, with Ethereum, it's uh, it's a general programming language. So you can actually program any arbitrary contract, including organizations. So you can define members, you can um, give them you know tokens, um, and and you can basically run a an organization or a company all through these sort of contracts. Yeah. Hmm. And and the Moon DAO. Why the moon? I mean, obviously, why not? The moon's the moon. But uh, <laughs> it, it, was it just a? It was it a love of space, or how did you? How did you make the connection between this new technology and uh, and our largest celestial neighbor? Yeah, well, it's it's a it's a long story, but I guess the abridged version is is mostly that um, my. Uh, me and some friends, we we found uh, a a massive lunar asteroid that we wanted to to purchase together collectively as a as a group, and um, we thought it'd be funny to call ourselves Moon Dao. Uh, you know, like we're an organization of people that control the moon, um, and it was, it was honestly just a joke. It was like uh, we we thought it would it'd be fun to kind of play with the 1967 Outer Space Treaty. You know, claim that we have ownership over. Um, you know the the biggest chunk of the moon, um, but then uh, we we kind of had the idea of trying to send someone into space, and then from there the the idea kind of grew naturally, um, and and there was always kind of in the background this concept of, well, um, you know, space represents this opportunity for people around the world to kind of unite uh, on something that you know everyone can kind of get behind, like this idea of becoming multiplanetary. And uh, right now we're kind of in this uh, space race between uh, China, the U.S., uh, private organizations that are all trying to, I guess, you know, um, settle the moon. Uh, if you if you talk to any of these uh, big uh, aerospace uh, companies or or uh, you know na national programs, um, uh, it, within the decade, pretty much all of them have something on the roadmap that they would like to have a, a presence on the moon. So it's, it's, we're living through, I think, one of the most exciting times in, in human history where we're going back to the moon, but this time actually to stay. And then uh, with, you know, the, um, the hope that, you know, that, that acts as a launch point to get us to Mars and, and so on. So it uh, honestly, like I kind of tripped into the idea, <laughs> um, but uh, we, we were able to raise uh, uh, much more than I expected to send someone into space. And 
um, like it, at first it, it really just started as this like internet movement to send someone into space and it resonated with a bunch of people. And um, so, yeah, we're, we're like, I guess, increasing our ambitions as we go. Now the, the DAO is focused on accelerating a lunar base. So uh, basically targeting all of the, all of the sort of uh, fundamental uh, technology um, like pain points that, that organizations are facing, like for example, surviving the lunar night and uh, trying to um, identify those challenges and then make it so that uh, people from around the world can help in, in, you know, solving those issues. So um, yeah, I, I think that we can accelerate a, a lunar base through basically people's creativity from all over the world. And so that's, that's mm. what we're trying to achieve with Mundo is to get more people involved in space. So, so is, uh, is Moondow a, a, a community where people buy with fiat currency, they buy these tokens, and then that, you know, gives them sort of access to the potential of going to space and the potential of getting involved in these opportunities and, you know, fun, moon-focused activities. Is that the kind of idea? Yeah, so I'd say Mundao caters to three types of uh, people. So one is uh, just general enthusiasts that they they like space. They don't necessarily work in space. They don't they aren't necessarily involved in space on a day to day basis. But the idea of uh, potentially being selected to you know go to space on a suborbital flight or do a zero gravity flight or you know just kind of like these experiences that are are only available to a select few. Um, and, and having the opportunity to do that, that's exciting to them. And so uh, by being a member of the DAO, you uh, can participate in those, those types of uh, events. So um, the DAO has a treasury, and we, we basically allocate funds from that treasury to do things like that for our community. So we've done zero gravity flights. Uh, we've bought two tickets with Blue Origin. Um, and that's like one set of, of people that, that um, you know, I think Moondow is, is attracting. Another set of people are people that want to help build the organization. So we call these citizens. So um, Mundao is kind of a network state. It's people from all over the world that want to co-govern this organization and want to work together to build out the organization. And they believe in this new medium of, of DAOs and um, smart contracts as a, a way to coordinate people from all over the world to work on these most pressing challenges. So. Um, I'd say that yeah, th those those are slightly more serious individuals, um, but um, that is also you know a, a major attractor for people um, in sort of building out this this new evolution of a of an organization that can um, you know kind of challenge or tackle some of these like really ambitious goals. And then the third type of uh, of group that we we cater towards too is um, industry. So. Uh, actual companies that are working or startups that are, that are working on space and then we uh, connect individuals in our community with those companies and um, and try to figure out how we can be useful to them in in any way whatsoever so um, you know either through promotion or through uh, engineering um, it's, you can kind of think of it as like our our, our company is, is trying to um, be the glue between them and um, individuals from all over the world that want to get involved in, in helping them. So you mentioned the the activities, so the zero G flights, um, and the, the the two. Have you have you secured two places on Blue Origin? Can you talk about that? Yeah. So we uh, it was it was like the organization moved really fast from its inception. So. Um, in December of 2021, we announced that, hey, we want to try to send someone to space. Um, and then by February of 2022, we had already purchased two seats with uh, Blue Origin. Um, so it was kind of a, a, a quick timeline. Um, by August of 2022, we we already sent someone into space. And um, now we have uh, another ticket that we are, we're looking to give to our community. Um, so, yeah. Uh, is it is it too late to uh for anyone listening to uh be in it to win it or no. is it <laughs> how does one get involved potentially well, that, that's that's part of the reason why I'm 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 doing these podcasts and stuff is to get the word out that hey uh if you'd like to go to space if you'd like to um 
you know have an opportunity then you know get involved in Moondao and and there's a chance um yeah. how how much i don't know if this is public information but how much does it cost for a blue origin ticket is that public information it's not public so um yeah uh as much as i'd like to comment on it you know i, I just i can't <laughs> no sure yeah. sure that makes sense yeah. um and what are your plans for 2024 is that a that's a main focus of the plan? What else are you doing in the next stages and or, you know engaging with industry? What what other plans can you can you speak of? Yeah, so the the thing that um, uh, most excites me is uh, internet institutions. So, I mean, you can think of like traditionally, um, you know, you have institutions within nations, and those are the ones that are are funding most of our space progress. So. Um, you can think of uh, DARPA or NASA or you know these these uh, countries that are pushing the the frontier. Um, but now we have this new opportunity through the internet of creating internet institutions. So um, there's no reason why uh, people from all over the world couldn't identify and fund missions and then basically uh, release requests for proposals in the same way that a government does and say, hey, we'd like to achieve this thing and then have uh, people from all over the world compete or you know, work on, on, on those things. So for example, like surviving the lunar night. Right now, that's something that is uh, very difficult for um, startups. Um, so you have you know, Astrobiotic, Intuitive Machines, iSpace, all of these organizations that are, uh, are putting a lot of, uh, of, uh, of money into uh, lunar missions, but they find it very difficult to actually have a sustained long-term presence on the moon mm. right now. So um, I think that there is room for a DAO or a collective of people from all over the world that want to support in those problems and they can support financially so they can help create the prize pool they can support creatively or intellectually by competing in those prize pools um and you know basically uh i think we can do like what the x prize did um i don't know if you're familiar mm. but online um and faster more transparent some something that is that that should really be emphasized about these tools is their transparency so um uh basically all of the transactions all of the things that we do inside of our organization are recorded immutably on the blockchain so mm. um y there's there's less trust involved and and i think this is something that like uh it, it's difficult to communicate because when when you hear crypto now people think of things like ftx <laughs> and i think it's really important to note that ftx is not a it's not the same thing as a DAO. So it's not actually following the uh, principles of the like open source crypto space. Um, it's actually just a regular company that is a black box. Um, people, users weren't able to see uh, what was happening with their funds. Um, and there, it was custodial. So th they were actually the custodians of that money. Uh, in our case, um, you know, every, when when you interact with the DAO, um, the tokens that you have are self self custodied. So there's no one inside of the organization that can you know take your tokens or do anything nefarious with with your money. And uh, this is actually you know a, a massive revolution I think in how uh, people can collaborate together because you're protected in that. Um, you know, you can collaborate with someone else without having to necessarily trust that they're going to, you know, uh, you know, you, you don't have to worry about them running off with the money, basically. No. Mm. And, and and is there a, a fixed supply of Moon Dow? So a bit like Bitcoin, where there's there's X amount, and if you've got in early, then the value is going to go up as more people buy into it. Apologies if I frame that in a terrible way. <laughs> <laughs> Well, there there is a fixed amount, and that was a decision made by uh, the the whole organization because we felt like that that would protect people that are um, you know uh, helping fund these missions if there is a, a fixed amount of the of the token. However, um, I think you know it's 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 really important to note that 
the token itself is a governance token. It's more like a, a, a currency. It's not equity in a, in a company. There's no dividend here. There's no distribution mm. of profits. And, um, you know, that that's important for a number of reasons, uh, but mostly because, uh, you know, within the the legal framework that exists today, um, if, if people are, are offering securities, which is a distribution of profits of their token, um, they, they need to be uh, basically uh, regulated by the SEC. So uh, our token is, is a governance token, which means that we're, we're not distributing any of the, of the profits of the organization. But um, what we do, uh, what, what we do with our, our organization, though, is that every single transaction, so every single outflow of the organization's money must be approved by the token holders. So um, all of the, the basically, the, the money that's in the organization um, gets put to use to whatever mean to, like whatever the community wants to do with it. Like it's not like I can like me as the founder or um, any of the of the of the people currently involved as you know um, the you know ex- executives inside of the the organization. We can just say, hey, we're going to do this now. Mm. Um, we actually need the the approval of the of the organization. Um, so it's basically bringing democracy into um, companies in a way that's like enforced through a, a smart contract. Um, it's a really unique medium, but it's it's sometimes difficult to to get across. Yeah, it is. You're you're good at explaining it, and I think I follow. I I suppose use the Blue Origin flights mm-hmm. as an example. So was the whole community given a voting right as to whether to support that? And what happened? What happened if you were against it? Is there a threshold, you know, like a, you know, voting on anything in a in a government where, I guess, fifty one percent vote for something? Does it get passed? Is that how it's worked out? Yeah. So uh, we have a we have a whole constitution actually that outlines our our whole governance practices from creating a proposal all the way to actually executing that on chain. Um, so yeah the the whole way through with these tickets we basically asked the community what do you guys want to do with it so um we asked them how much of the treasury do you want to allocate towards purchasing tickets to go to space and then we asked them okay what do you want to do with these tickets and then they voted they said with one of them we want to vote on who gets to go and the other we want to do a sweepstakes and then we said okay well who who do you want to have you know win these tickets and then so the whole community uh basically reached out to people uh, from all over the world. And uh, then we voted within the community on on who actually got to go. And then with the other one, we actually also voted to say, okay, how do you want to design the sweepstakes? And then the community voted on, okay, well, this is how we want to do the sweepstakes. So we we basically asked the the community um, what they want to do. And sometimes it's like, um, it's tricky because people ask me like, what what are Mundas next steps? And I'm like, well, Mm. it's whatever the community wants to wants to do so um yeah and do you have more weight for your voting rights if you have more moon dao so we use a system called quadratic voting um which is it, it's a cool system so basically what it means is we take the square root of the amount of tokens that you have and that is your voting power and what that means is that as someone you know if someone acquires a bunch of the token um, they they will never be able to control the entire organization. So, in crypto, oftentimes you have what's called a fifty one percent attack. So, um, say you know one person acquires fifty one percent of all of the tokens. Does that mean that they control Moondout now? So the answer there is no, because uh, so, and I I think it's worth maybe doing a little bit of mental math here. So say you have nine tokens. So your voting power is the square root of nine, which three. Is three. Yes, yeah. <laughs> my, that's the extent nice. of my uh, quick maps availability. <laughs> yeah, um, but yeah, so it's kind of like as as someone's uh, stake in the organization gets higher and higher, um, there there's kind of diminishing returns. Yeah, really interesting. Have you? I'm sure you thought about this. This is obviously a a space podcast. Imagining a future in in when humanity is living and working in space, civilians like me. Is the idea that this would exchange a sort of fiat currency where you don't buy goods or services, you essentially, everyone has everything and you sort of vote as a community 
to make decisions on a say on a space station or a moon base uh, is that is that where this is going in your head yeah ab- absolutely so um i think you know the like the exploration of celestial bodies is an opportunity to rethink how we want to organize ourselves as um a community and uh it's a blank slate so we basically get to look at it with fresh eyes and say how how would um you know how would the founding fathers like organize things with these new tools and so i think it's like super exciting to like look at these new uh governance tools and say hey like maybe there's an opportunity here to do something um where we enshrine the rights of individuals um in uh neutral and uh basically uh in- enforced code rather than enforced by by humans um so humans are a little bit messy sometimes and maybe we uh enforce the laws selectively um but in this case you have uh uh laws that are enforced just by code directly there's no opportunity for um you know someone getting special treatment and i think that that that's something that um will have a, a massive impact in sort of like justice um What's your what's your background? Because you you clearly have a, uh, you know a, a a sort of. Do you come from a financial background? At a guess. <laughs> um, so I I was a software engineer at, at Google. Um, so I worked um, on a few different projects, uh, mostly like robotics types of projects. Um, I worked on the autonomous car that they have. Um, I I worked uh, on a Google X project um which is their like accelerator um and then i also worked at youtube in uh, virtual reality um i did study some business but i actually didn't really enjoy it so much <laughs> i i studied mechanical engineering and computer science but mm. um yeah my my experience um in sort of this big tech world uh really did inform uh my like like I think oftentimes people ask like why 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 use this DAO thing you know especially because it's um, you know it's involved in crypto and people think that crypto is this sort of like uh, terrible thing uh, depending on who you ask you know it's a, it's a risky sort of bet um, but I think it's you know out of all of the technologies available uh, it presents a unique opportunity to give power into the hands of uh, as many individuals as possible and um you know i think that uh so I, I was working on you know fleets of autonomous vehicles and um i think it's likely that uh you know if you were to extrapolate out into the future that um this sort of um uh like that you we will see greater and greater centralizing forces when it comes to technology so um you know more money will go into the hands of fewer and fewer people as you can kind of scale uh through ai and and robotics um and so i think it's really imperative that we figure out as a civilization how to protect people um and how how to get those systems of uh ai and 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 robots to um basically work for people um rather than maybe just a select group of individuals so um yeah kind of like i mean i i don't think that th- this technology is going to solve everything i think it'll probably introduce new problems but it's sort of you have to take that iterative approach you know like uh, identify the problems that are that exist currently in the system try to mitigate them and then solve the new problems so um yeah and and how is it how has it been for you as a founder? Have you had any sort of conflicts? Because, you know, it is a business. Obviously, I assume you want to make money along the way. How how do you ensure that, you know, the, the, the sort of, it's, it's, you know, you touched on AI. It's like, how do you ensure that the way you program this system, you know, doesn't enrich the founders too much? And, it's, and it stays true to its original commitment of, decentralizing and uh you know keeping it equitable uh, have, you, have you thought about that much yeah i mean um i think that 
the difficulty with anything like this, um, where you have, you know, someone like myself, like saying like, oh, I'm, I'm trying to uh, do this to help people. Um, is that like, well, I'm a person too. <laughs> and I'm just as, you know, fallible uh, as, as anyone else. Um, and, you know, I guess we're, we're all sinners to some extent. So um, I think it's, it's natural to go, okay, well, what's in it for you? Why, why are you doing this? And um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's definitely tricky. Like, like I said, all of the payments um, that come out of the treasury are voted on by the community. So uh, there have been multiple times where me and, and some of the other people that are working on the DAO, we go, hey, would would you guys like to pay us? <laughs> and how much would you like to pay us? And obviously, we want to get paid well, but, you know, we also don't want to, you know, ex exploit the treasury. So we have to ask the community and say, hey, well, do you guys, would you guys like to pay us for this? And it can be tough sometimes because some, some people in the community are like, ah, fuck you guys. <laughs> you know, like, yeah, we don't want to pay you guys at all. It's like, well, we did all this work. Um, so, you know, you kind of have to have those conversations, which are um, like a little bit uncomfortable sometimes. But mm. I think that the, the silver lining in that, though, is that, you know, you're seeing those conversations happen out in, in public, you know. Um, there's no executive that can just, you know, sign themselves like some massive salary and say, hey, and that's something that you see in nonprofits or in in government right now, because there are these black boxes. You don't know how much uh, administrative overhead there is in those organizations. Uh, but in our case, you can actually just look on the blockchain and say, okay, well, Pablo's getting this much. You can actually see exactly how much my salary has been, <laughs> which if, is kind of I, weird. <laughs> if I had any chance of looking on the blockchain and working out, I would definitely do that and put that in the show notes. But <laughs> I don't have the technical know-how currently. Yeah. Well, what's, what's... We, we, we try to make it easy. So we have dashboards and stuff. So you can see like mm. how much is moving out. And we do a transparency report too. So we what's try to make big... it so people can see it. That makes sense. What, what's the biggest challenge about the the education side of these sort of technologies? Because it it has been around for a, a few years, crypto. Um, but it's still it's a bit like the space industry really you know there's people who are obsessed with it and and then there's everybody else so how do you how do you you try and grow it and uh, and educate people as you go obviously coming on podcasts and things like this helps but um you know what other what other strategies do you have to to educate people and get them involved um in that mm -hmm. way um, well, right now, the the most difficult thing that we come up against is like onboarding new individuals. So teaching them about a wallet and about their cryptographic keys and how to keep those safe and how to, you know, interact with smart contracts and what is actually happening under the hood. Um, you know, I think that this is like uh, it's 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 difficult because you kind of are your own bank. You know, like you don't you don't trust someone else to custody your funds. You you custody your funds. And then if um, if you lose your key or something, you know, like there's no support line, there's no customer support that you can call and say, hey, I want. My... <laughs> so mm. uh, it, it is a big responsibility. And I think that scares people a little bit. So we're trying to make it simple and understandable and comprehensible for people um that are just getting involved and to do so with maybe just a little bit of of money nothing you know major like you don't want to put your life savings into this stuff it's quite volatile um mm. and i think that's also something to to keep in mind uh, to tell because some people are just like gamblers you know and they'll like put in way too much <laughs> it's like like i i don't want that for you <laughs> and you shouldn't want that for yourself either uh, but I think that's kind of one of the hardest things about crypto too, is that um, like some people treat it as like, oh, I'm I'm going to put money into this thing, make a bunch of money and then leave. And, you know, I'm going to be rich, you know, tomorrow or something. And it's like, well, um, like the whole point of this movement is that um, if we're successful, you won't have to go back to that other thing. You won't have to have fiat money. Um, you'll be able to transact and, and work with others um, and, and use, you know, this sort of currency um, and and have all of these guarantees of, of uh, protection. Um, like, and, and <laughs> like, 
I think it's worth mentioning, you know, like our system is pretty broken. You know, it's more the um, like it is not it, it's more the rule than the exception that um, people's fiat currency gets devalued enormously. And I think that sometimes like maybe we don't think about it so much because it kind of happens to maybe third world countries or, you know, it's like, oh, this isn't going to happen to people in the first world, uh, but it does. Um, and yeah, like there's nothing, <laughs> I mean, I could talk forever about how, how money currently works. It's, it's quite fascinating. Um, you know, like that, and, and, and some of it just sounds so absurd when, when you articulate it about, you know, um, yeah, there's this, uh, private organization, um, called the federal reserve that can print as much money as they'd like. <laughs> and, um, uh actually most fiat currencies are backed by the u.s dollars so there's this one point of failure and the um u.s has uh, 33 trillion dollars in debt right now <laughs> so i don't know what what how this is going to be resolved um i hope that it'll be resolved um in a way that uh, protects people but if you look at countries like venezuela argentina I mean, the list really goes on um, in terms of, you know, countries that haven't managed their, their debt appropriately and then what that does to people's life savings. And it's heartbreaking and it's terrible. Um, and I think that people maybe think, oh, the, this will never happen to us. But, you it's, know, it's very interesting to think about and um, very topical. And uh, it, it's been great chatting to you. What's your sort of sort of. Uh, why to look on the space industry what's going on and how do you how do you see the moon dow fitting into you know current efforts you know things like the artemis missions and um you know private companies like spacex and and blue origin you know other than getting people to space and democratizing access how how would you like moon dow to sort of join that movement in the future yeah, um, I think that if if we do our job well, that the the DAO can be a neutral medium, and so that means that you can have countries that otherwise don't really trust each other that can work together on things. So, um, back in the days of the space race, I mean, you you still had the U.S. and Russia, even though they didn't really see eye to eye uh, politically, they would still work together on on space, and so. I think that um, you know, if if you can create a neutral medium where people can work together, um, then you could have a, one organization where you know uh, citizens from China, from Russia, from the U.S. all collaborate and work together in in building this sort of future. And I think it's a massive opportunity. There are few things that unite people like uh, space does or like exploration does. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty bullish on the idea of. Uh, of uh, internet institutions that can push the frontier forward and we can identify challenges that, you know, um, uh, like unite us and that we can work together on, um, like having a lunar base or exploring Mars. Um, it's really exciting stuff. And, you know, if the thing holding us back is politics, um, then we should try to solve that. Uh, we should try to fi figure out new mediums where people can collaborate. I think that's a great way to end uh, end the the half hour. Um, for anyone listening that is interested in buying some Moon Dow or acquiring some Moon Dow, I don't know how you'd refer to it as. What do they What do they do? Um, give them a somewhere to point them, and I'll put the details in the show notes as well. Totally. Uh, so you can go to MoonDow.com, and uh, from there, uh, you you click launch app, and that takes you to our Moon Dow app, and it walks you through the rest. So. Um, we, we try to make it straightforward, um, but if you if you're having any issues as you're you know navigating this, the the community, uh, jump into our Discord. So if you go to discord.gg/moondow, then you'll be able to to jump in. Um, you can also follow us on Twitter at uh, at official moondow, um, all one word. Um, I suppose it's X now, but you know. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah. And uh yeah, I mean we're we're pretty friendly. We don't bite. We're a pretty open community. Our community is open source too. Like all, all of the conversations, all of the work that people are doing is happens out in the open. And so yeah, we're we're pretty friendly. So come say hi, you know, and we're we're just 
normal individuals. <laughs> so just hang out and uh, and get to know us. And yeah, sounds great. Well, look, uh, I really appreciate you coming on. Um, and I guess uh, to the moon or to the moon, Dal, I should say. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Pablo, yeah. thank you very much. Thank you, Ben. Yeah.